gonna, I'll go ahead and start. I apologize if I do kind of glance back. I got a couple of things going. Um, but uh, we're in uh, Hebrews chapter 12. And um, next week, surprise, surprise, we'll be in chapter 13. Um, I want to be here, and really what I want to do next week is a pretty in-depth review of Hebrews from the first up to 13, and then finish with 13. So tonight, I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on, on review up until now. I'll just touch some highlights, and then we'll talk about uh, chapter 11, just because it spills into 12 very nicely. Um, if you missed last week, you missed a real treat. That was an awesome class on, on chapter 11 last week. Um, but having said that, I've got the slides in here. Um, you know, the book of Hebrews, again, was written to the Hebrews, to the, to the, to the Jewish Christian that were under stress to, uh, um, to leave the faith and go back to Judaism. Um, stress from, from family, from religious leaders, um, coming from all different angles. And the, and the Hebrew writer was writing to remind them of their... Uh, the superiority of their of their mission and their and their faith. Um, awesome, thank you, sir. And so uh, he has spent the better part, well, actually all of the book of of Hebrews, um, in uh, building his case, if you will, um, speckled in with with some exhortations and all, but but just to try to make his case for why you shouldn't leave. Um, and 12 and 13 is more of a, uh, um, okay, so then what now? If, 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 that's, if that be, is the case, um, what do we do now? And so we'll, we'll start, um, just dip our toe a little bit into chapter 11. Chapter 11, he wrote about the uh, was the Hall of Faith, I think, is 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 what we called it last week. And again, that was an that was just that was an awesome class. And and he reminded the Jews of of their heroes, the the Abrahams, the Moses, the the, the people that they looked up to, and and how their faith um, um, moved them through. And and, and one thing that, that that was again brought up last week, and that and. Is, is the examples that he used, how many of them were perfect? You remember? None. Yeah, zero. And so, so um, but even without being perfect, they had faith and that faith allowed them to, to, to do things. A, a, another thing that, uh, and, and I hope I'm not getting ahead of myself, I don't think I am, um, that, that, that I found interesting as I'm reading through this is again, you know, you've got the, the the, the, the Jews the, are on one side, and you've got the Christian that happen to be Jews on the other side, and it's almost like you've got this side saying, you need to come back. You need to come back. You've left your heritage. You've turned your back on your people. You need to come back. And one thing about this hall of faith is that these Christians that were over here, the, one of the, the cases that the Hebrew writer made was, you're the ones that have things in common with these heroes not this other group, right? Because what were these people living by? That same type of faith. And, and, and that's what he's going to touch on in chapter 12. He, 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 he built the case in 11 of the faith. And look at what these people, that, that the Jewish people, that, 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 that both groups hold up as, as fathers or as, as, as heroes. And, and their faith. And them being imperfect. Um, which brings us to chapter 12. So that's kind of the backdrop for 12. Um, and we'll just, uh, and again, my timekeeper's back there. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time in, in verse 1, 2, and 3 because there's just a lot in here. I'm going to try to not, and again, since we do have, if I have to cut something a little short, we'll cut next week's um, um, summary short. Um, but starting in in, in Verse 1 of chapter 12, therefore, and again, that therefore is, he just got through going through this, this, this list of, of, of people of faith in the Old Testament. Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run the race with endurance, 
the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Um, again, there's a lot in there. So the picture that he's drawing here is, is a, as an athlete in an arena. And what do we have, what is, the, what is the crowd that is cheering us on and watching this race? <laughs> Who are some of the people in that crowd according to this picture he's drawing? Remember? <laughs> Moses, Abraham, Daniel, David. Um, and, and the picture is that those people have run this race, those people have, have finished, and again, if you remember, 11 ended saying they didn't even receive the prize yet. The, the, when they ran, it was something different than what, what, what you guys are being able to see. Um, let's see here. Um, the objective of the race of faith is, is to finish. Okay, and, and it's not how fast you run. He doesn't spend a lot of time on, on that. The, 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 the point that he's making is run in such a way to finish the race. Um, and he starts out by saying, let us lay aside every weight. Um, apotithemi, which I believe is how that's pronounced, is, is, a, is a Greek word and it's made up of two words. Apo, which is is from or away and then tithemi. And the idea is to lay something down and then to push it. And, and the reason I bring that up is that word is a, it's an action word that, that, that he's telling the readers and, and in essence telling us that, that we are to lay, we are to be active in something. There's something that we need to do. Um, it's not just uh, cross your fingers and hope. Um, there, there's, there's work we've got to do just like a, a uh, uh, an athlete would do. Um, and then, you got away from my notes. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, Do you not know that those who run, and again, this is Paul writing to Corinth, do you not know that those who run the race all run, but only one receives a prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self control in all things. And they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. And this is the key here in verse 26 that I tied to, to this thought that the Hebrew writer is saying, therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. This is interesting here. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I will not myself be disqualified. Um. So he, he starts off with, with this race. He, he draws this picture. Uh, you're in the, uh, the Coliseum running this race with this great crowd of, of witnesses cheering you on. And, um, and then he talks about how we need to run the race and how we need to prepare to run the race. And just like in, Paul said in Corinthians, um, preparation is, is vital for us to do it. Um, there, and there's a reason for it. And so he's, he, he tells us to do two things to run this race. And again, this is, I, I entitled all these on, this is on the how to run. Um, and he's saying that you should lay aside every weight. And, and this isn't the sin. He'll, he'll talk about the sin here in a minute. But this is the things that are not necessarily in and of themselves sinful, but that would hinder you from running the race. You know, if you think of an athlete, um, when you run, so I'm told, <laughs> actually I, I, I used to run, I used to run a lot, um, I, I, I did. Um, if you see me running now, you need to run with me because there's something very scary coming the other way. But, but you burn energy, right, as you run, it takes energy to run and you burn that energy and, and, and we only have so much energy before it gives out. And so I kind of think of it as unnecessary energy burn, things that would drag on you, not necessarily sinful, but that, that, that get in the way of, uh, of running. What, what would some of those things be, do you think? What? Worry. Worry. 
that's a, let's start with the, one of the biggest ones. Um, does worry weigh on us? Can worry cause us to not be able to run? Um, slow us down? Absolutely. What else? How about money? Is money evil? Can it get in our way? It certainly can. Closely tied to worry. Worrying about money might, might even be doubly. What else is there? Friends. Friends. Who said that? Absolutely. Why? Yeah. I'll tell you another thing about friends. I'll even go and say family. When we worry about, and it's back to that worry, but when, when, when we're concerned with trying to make friends or family happy with what we're doing as opposed to doing what's right, that can take our, our eye off of the, off, off of the goal. And, and, and um, Anything else? That's great. Work, absolutely. You, you, that's right up there with worry. It's probably the, the one and two survey said. Um, that, that hits us all, and that's, that's, that's tough. And, and, and so, again, the Hebrew writers telling these people, and thus us, that, that we have to take an active role in making sure that those things don't slow us down. Right? You, you can't not work. And I would even say you, you can't really not worry. As humans, that, that's what we do. But how do we condition ourselves? Remember, Paul in Corinthians says that, that I, I run or I box. That's why I loved about it. I, when I box and you think of a guy sitting there practicing boxing, he's not acting like he's, he's hitting air. He's actually boxing as if he's hitting somebody. He's got to make sure that he conditions himself to be able to do that. And we've got to because that's just real world. Um, respect, that was another one that I had thrown in there. kind of goes uh, real close with friends. We worry about whether people, the outside, are going to respect us. So we watch what we say or we watch what we do or, or, or it can get, get in our way. Um, really what we're talking about here is a shift in mindset. And this has weighed on me for the last three weeks real heavy. It's, just, it's really been um, driven into me. But we have to change our outlook. And it ceases to be, I mean, take this activity and, 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 and that's going to go into the blank. And the phrase could be something like, is it wrong to fill in the blank? And we need to get change from that to, will fill in the blank help me run or hurt me from running? And, and, and ask ourselves that and, and each other that. And, and again, that's not whether or not it's, you know, the Bible doesn't say not to do this or this is, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing this. Yeah, that might not be, it might not be simple, but it could be something wrong with doing it. Um, so that's, that's number one. Number two, yeah, we're good, we're good. We're still on verse two. We're all right. Nothing to worry about. Um, is get rid of the sin. He, he says that we have to lay aside the encumbrance and the sin which, and he's going to say a couple of things about sin that, that, that we'll, uh, we'll touch on here. Um, first thing he says about sin is that it entangles us, it, which I really like the visual, visual of a runner um, getting tripped up on, getting his feet caught up in ropes or, or, or something. Um, how easy would it be to run? And, and does sin not do that um, to us? Um, it, it, it most certainly, um, certainly can. I think we got to be careful. Not only is it the sin that's in front of us is a stumbling block that we might commit, um, or that we even might be trying to stay away from that could cause us to, to, to not run, but also past sin and, and worrying about things that we might have done. How heavy is guilt? Um, and again, you imagine yourselves running a race carrying just a real big load. Um, it's, again, it's not about winning. You're not going to be able to finish. You're going to be out before, before you can go. Um, and the other thing he says about sin 
is it easily entangles us. And how true is that? T to me, that screams out the danger of sin. And, and we can never get to that point to where we feel um, so comfortable that we don't have to worry about sin entangling us. We, we've, we've got to be on the lookout um, for that. And then, <clears throat> he says that we should run with endurance. Um, I worked for a guy, Rob, I don't know who I'm talking about, but he used to always tell me, um, and he just, he just beat it into my head. Uh, I can hear him right now saying it, but he would say, it's a marathon, not a sprint. If we were setting in some process or we were setting up, doing some, some change management, and he would always tell me, he could see the frustration building up in me, and he would always tell me, it's a marathon and not a sprint. And so I learned, I had to learn the hard way. He wasn't telling me to relax because that's not what he was about. Um, but he was saying, pace yourself. Um, don't, don't, get, don't get burnt out and, and, and make sure you do it. And so that just kept playing over and over in my mind as I was reading this part. Um, that it's, it's, a, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And so what does endurance as a runner take? We're going to run a race. If we're all, if we're all going to meet out at 5 in the morning and we're going to run 10 miles, is that something... First of all, if we do that, y'all need to show up because you got to see me run, you know, five feet and then sit down. But, but, uh, yeah, but we, yeah, so tonight you need to really work on your endurance for tomorrow's 10 mile run. Right? What's that? Right, I mean, the whole thought, the whole idea of endurance means what? Preparation, that's something that you've got to work on and you've got to prepare for. How long should you prepare for this race that we're talking about, do you think? It's our whole life. Right? We're always preparing um, to be in tip-top shape. That's exactly right. Um, so so I, I, I've got a couple of things, and I can't remember what my click looks like, but I think they're going to all pop up there, so I'll just, boom, throw them up. Um, Patience, like you, you, you've got to have patience. You can't just give up. If you, if you cramp up and you can't go, you, you don't just stop running. You've got to have patience. Um, it certainly takes a commitment. You've got to have a commitment to run that race. And, and again, echoing why we're here tonight, it also, I mean, a very important part of that is support. Um, we're we're going to read a kind of a little stretch here in a minute um, that, that, that I think could tip towards towards even that support. But but that's that's not reading too much into it. That's what endurance takes. And he says run with endurance, um, the race that's setting before us. And he also says something else. Um, and he says, fixing your eyes upon Jesus. And what did he say? Do you, anybody remember what he says about Jesus? He says that he's the author and perfecter of what? of faith. Um, I, I, I spent probably too much time on that whole phrase and, and looking into it. And one thing that I thought was interesting is, is I've, I've always read that as he's the author and perfecter of our faith. Um, but the, the, the actual um, uh, word there that's translated as for is, is, is the. So he's the author and perfecter of faith, of the faith. Um, what does that mean? And again, author is one use of the word. Anybody else have something different in a translation? Um, I always look at it as the start and the finish. Absolutely right. It, it, it all begins and ends with Jesus. Christ didn't come to abolish the law, but to what? What did he say? Fulfill the law. And so faith, and again, think back to chapter 11. 
What do we talk about in 11? This faith. This faith of who? Abraham, Moses. We just got through saying it. Um, what the Hebrew writer is saying in this, in this somewhat small of, of, of a phrase is that, that it, it, that faith, that same faith they had started and ended with Jesus. What, what do you mean ended? No, no, no. I'm just making it up. I think he's uh, real specific in, in before that when he talks about let us uh, lay aside every weight and every sin. Uh, the definite article is there just like it is with faith. And so I think specifically in the context, the sin is unbelief. Yep. He's got a whole chapter on faith. Don't let unbelief get you. And Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith. I think he's very specifically referencing the sin of unbelief. Yep. Yeah, because it's not plural. It's, it's sin, the sin that, that, that so quickly entangles. Absolutely right. And, and, and again, is there anything else coming? Re remember, what are the, this group of Jews, what are they doing? Even to this day, they're waiting. What is this group doing? What are we doing? We're waiting for the Messiah, but in a different way, aren't we? Because he's already come. We're just waiting for him to come take us home. And so that's, that's the difference in the faith. And again, the Hebrew writer saying that faith we talked about in 11 is the same faith you have. Not these guys. Those who worship the tent or, or what follow, the, we'll get into that next week. It's one of my favorite phrases. Um, how are we doing? We're good. Halfway? Oh, moving on? Okay. Um, move on. Um, I got a lot on this one. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to jump in here. This is, this is, apologize. I'm going to go back since it's been a while since we read it. Um, I'm going to read verse 2 again. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Um, so Christ paid a price for our sin. What, what is the wages of sin? What price did he pay? death. And so he died so that we may not have to die for that sin. There's another price he paid besides death. Um, let's, let's, <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I get caught up on a couple of side deals. I, 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 uh, um, and, and we can talk after this if you want, but, but I, I read a really, really good book on, on crucifixion. It was a very interesting um, historical dig into crucifixion. It, it was interesting is that there's not a lot on it. Um, you won't find very many first century crucifixion manuals. And one of the things this author that, that has studied it, he was, uh, he was actually a German soldier in World War II. And, um, and became a, a, a Bible, well, well respected Bible scholar. But he said you couldn't find a lot of stuff because it was so despised even by the people that did it that no one even wrote about it. Um, it was, uh, uh, let's see. So, so, so just the, the, the form of his death, um, I know that, uh, where was the quote? There was a quote. Um, in, in, in the movies and in art, when you see Jesus hanging on the cross, what is he always wearing? A loincloth. Well, you know, when they, when they uh, crucified these people, they weren't wearing anything. They were, they were stripped. They, it was degrading. It was shameful. The chief of it, of shame. Um, and, and, um, Let's see. One of the quotes from, it was an utterly offensive affair. 
um, that uh, he was, we all know the story about how he was beaten, how he was spit upon, how he was completely um, left by anybody that was his supporters and uh, um, extremely shameful. In Deuteronomy, if you want to turn, you can. Um, I'm, I'm going to fly through this because um, just because I am. But Deuteronomy chapter 21, and I don't think I have it on a slide. Nope, all I've got is this. It says, if a man committed a sin worthy of death and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not hang there all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him the same day. For he who, hang, who, he who is hanged is a curse of God. And in Galatians 3, 13, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For his written curse is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of spirit through faith. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21, he made him who, had, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. So Christ took a punishment of death. He took the death and paid that price for us. But he also took our shame, right? Anyone who breaks a law is, is cursed. And he took that from us. He became that for us in our place. Um, uh, yeah. That's, you should be well emphasized that the, the death was the easiest part. Everything up to that, the persecution, the spitting on the, the Greek there, I, if I remember correctly, it's, it's uh, hurled insults and the despicable behavior that they did to him. No telling what all they did. I mean, the people we hear of and Muslim that are tortured today have nothing on what was done to Jesus before he finally died. The death was our, what we look to, but what got him the endurance of endure the shame <coughs> and everything. He, he didn't deserve any of that. We deserved it all. And, and you, you got to know that hurt. A different kind of hurt. I mean, think of in Psalms 22 when he says, a, a band of evil men have encircled me. Dogs have surrounded me. Not only was all that done, but it was done by evil men to this perfect person. So, so no, no doubt. And, 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 I, and I think that that is, uh, that is certainly there. But then what, what does he end with that, that section? He ended up saying what? That he sat at the right hand on the throne of God after all that was done. Um, and so that's key. One other thing that, that I want to hit on real quick is, uh, I'll read it one more time. Um, it says, the, uh, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. What's he talking about? What joy? And this is just something that I, have, I had missed when I had read it before. Um, what's he talking about? What joy is he looking forward to? Save us. Save us. He saved us. Um, I'm going to read John 16. And this is him kind of explaining, Jesus kind of explaining to his apostles what's about to happen. He's more He's not as much explaining what's going to happen, but he's kind of preparing them um, for, for, for what's going to happen. And he says, a little while and you'll no longer see me. And again, a little while and you'll see me. And some of his disciples then said to one another, what is this thing he's telling us? A little while and you'll not see me. And then again, in a little while you'll see me. And because I go to the Father. So they were saying, what is it this is, he says in a little while? We don't know what he's talking about. In verse 19, Jesus knew that they wished to question him, and he said to them, Are you deliberating about this together? That, that I said, A little while you will not see me, and again in a little while you will see me. In verse 20, Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Um... And so I, I, don't know, I, I'd read it in the past and just kind of thought Jesus knew he was going to heaven and there's joy in heaven. And so he endured the cross 
because he knew how great heaven was. But we know there's something wrong with that line of thinking because where was Christ before he came down? Right? He didn't have to endure the cross to get heaven. He gave that up. And he, he, he's telling his disciples here that you're going to lament, but then you're going to have joy. And that joy is because he knew what was going to happen. So whose joy would, did he go to the cross for? His own? Ours. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yep. Um, there it is. So, so we are the joy of the cross. And again, the Hebrew writers talking to these Hebrew Christians, telling them that, right? That 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 that, that, that what what Christ had done for him, and and this is all in the context of what. Fixing your eyes upon him, fixing, fixing your eyes upon that fact as you run this race. Um, and especially I think of these brethren in this time, it must have been just a horrible time for them to be going through. And, and this, this was very comforting. And, 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 I, and I tell you, it, it has helped me just being close to this, you know, when you, when you study and you get in involved in scripture to where you're having to stand up here and talk about it you it, it's such a blessing because it, it it's just been that part of of this whole thing is has has, has really been a lot for me um, any other thoughts I don't want to rush we have plenty of time my wife shaking her head no but we do we have plenty of time Absolutely, we knew that. Um, you know, I think of him in the garden before, so distraught about what he was going through and all the things that he was going through. But um, I, I think so. I think that's safe. One thought that God had was that in the end of the verse there, it says he sat down at the, the throne uh, of God. And, right in, and that signifies he's done. I mean, his sacrifice for us was perfect and complete and permanent. And he sat down. I've missed that probably the first several times I've read, I've read that. Well, sitting down is exactly what that means. It's not done. Um, the beginning and the end of the faith. Um, it's, it's finished. Very good. Point there, not there. Okay, so verse 3. <laughs> I told you. For consider him who has endured the, such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow le weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor, the, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom love the Lord, excuse me, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as, as with sons, for what, what son is there that, whom his father does not discipline? For you, if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers discipline us, and we respected them for it. Shall, shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For, the, for they disciplined us for a short time as, they seem, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems to not be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields peaceful fruit of righteousness. So we will start. Consider him. Um, 
consider, and we just got through talking about the suffering um, and the things that he did, and then he, he moves into a little bit um, of, of, of a different slant. You know, in, in, in I think it was John 15, and we were, we, we just mentioned that earlier, but when he says the world, um, don't be surprised when the world hates you, they hated me first. Um, you know, that, that's, that's this, this consider, consider Christ. But he says that you have not yet suffered um, to the point of shedding blood, as Jesus had done. Um, and uh, then he quotes from Proverbs. And as he says, as children, we should expect discipline. And then he uses also there in verse 6, he uses the phrase scourge and you know, I, that almost brings this, this thought to mind of, of uh, um, whip, whip in shape, to whip in, in, in shape. Um, but there's a, there's a Greek word here. Um, yeah, a little bit too. Paideia. And you can see this is, the, this is from Strong's. This is the... Uh, uh, definition of that word is the whole training and education of children. Um, it also includes care and training of the body. So it's, it's, it's more than a spanking. When he's saying discipline, he's talking more of, of training. And if you think of uh, in sports, if somebody says they're a disciplined team, that means that they, they do the things they're supposed to do. They've been, they've been trained and in, in, in been right. And so this discipline that he's talking about from the Lord is he's saying that the things that we're going to go through, you should expect discipline. Um, and in fact, what? If you don't have discipline, what does that mean? He uses a pretty strong term. Yeah, you, you're illegitimate. You're not real children. Um, that he reminds them. Um, and then he says in verse 9 and 10, I think I can get this in. Um, ooh, maybe not. He said that our earthly fathers would discipline and we would respect them, right? And so how much more should we respect God? But then what does he say about earthly fathers? He says that they disciplined us for a little while as they, what does that mean? With what they had, right? Um, and, and, and I think we talked about this a little bit on Sunday, but what do we know? as fathers or as mothers, as parents about our kids. Um, I guess I should say fathers. Mothers seem to know everything. I, mean, I know mine always did. But uh, um, basically, our, our earthly parents that we, that we respect trained us imperfectly. They didn't know everything. They did not know everything about us. And we'll talk about God's discipline next week right before we get into chapter 13. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you.